In this course, you will learn how to use Python to automate everyday tasks, such as creating an Excel report, sending text messages, extracting tables from websites, interacting with websites, and more. You will learn how to use a few Python automation libraries over a series of projects. Frank Andrade created this course. Frank is a data scientist and an experienced teacher. Make sure to check the description for a link to the code and an automation cheat sheet Frank created for this course. Okay, now let's see how to extract tables from a website. In Python, we can use the pandas library to extract tables from websites like Wikipedia, as you can see here. So here I have a list of the Simpsons episodes in Wikipedia, and we can extract all the tables that you can see here. So we only need to use the pandas library, and I'm going to show you how to do this right now. So we go here, and I'm using Jupyter Notebooks right now. And to install pandas, first you have to write pip install pandas. So in Jupyter Notebooks, you have to use this exclamation mark. But if you're using PyTerm or the terminal, just write pip install pandas. All right, once you install pandas, we have to import it. So we write import pandas and we write as pd. So pd represents pandas. So first we import this and then to extract tables from websites, we only have to write pd.read underscore html. So inside this parentheses, we have to write the link of the website. So here I open quotes and paste the link of this website, which I copied before. And now this is going to return a list. So this list is going to have multiple tables because here in the website, there are not only one, but like 20 tables. So we're going to get like 20 tables in a list. So I'm going to name this list Simpsons. So this is my Simpsons list. And now I run this and we get this tables inside this list. So let's see first how many tables are in this website. So here I write land Simpsons and here I run this and we have 23 tables. So let's get only the first table or actually the second because I think the second is the one that corresponds to the first season. And as you can see here, we have the second table which corresponds to the first season of the Simpsons. So we have here episode one, two, three and so on. And if we go here, we can verify that this is the same data. So I have here season one and you can see that is the same data. So we successfully extracted all the information in this table. Now let's perform some basic web scraping with pandas. Web scraping consists in extracting data from websites. So instead of doing it manually, we can automate it with some web scraping techniques. And in this video, we're going to extract CSV files from a URL using only pandas. So here is the target website we're going to scrape and it's this one. So this website contains data about football matches of different leagues. So here you can see a lot of leagues. And now I'm going to choose the first one that says England football results. And here we're going to see some data about Premier League and other leagues that England has. And if I want to download one of these files, I will have to click on any of those. And as you can see here, I downloaded that CSV file of the first listed here. So this one corresponds to the season 21-22 and is from the Premier League. So instead of manually downloading each file, we can use a specific pandas method to read these files from the internet. And also by using the for loop, we can automate this and download all the files that you can see here. So instead of clicking one by one, we can download all the files listed here. So there are a lot of them and we can download it just with pandas and a for loop in Python. So let's do it here. And now I'm going to show you how to extract data from a single CSV file from this website. So to do that, we have to use the read underscore CSV method. So we write PD that read underscore CSV open parenthesis. And we've used this method before, 
but when we use it, we read some data that was in the folder where we were working. So in the folder where this Jupyter notebook file was located. But in this case, we're not going to read anything inside our computer, but we're going to read data that is in a website. So instead of writing the path of the file in your computer, in this case, we're going to write that link of the file. So here I'm going to show you this file has a link. So if we want to download, we have to make a request to that link to get that file. So I'm going to show you here, I'm going to right click and now I'm going to copy the link address. So I copy and now I'm going to paste it here and now I press enter and let's see what's going to happen. So I press enter and as you can see here, instead of going to the website, it downloaded the file. So this means that this link contains the data we want to extract. So we're going to use this link. So I'm going to copy again here, copy. I'm going to make sure this is the address. So copy link address and now go back here, open quotes, paste the link. And this is the link we want to extract because it contains here that that CSV. So this means that this is a CSV file. And as you might remember, we read here a CSV because we're using the read underscore CSV method. So that's everything you have to do to read this CSV file that is stored in this website. So now I'm going to run this and let's see the results. So here, as you can see, all the data was read here with a read underscore CSV and it was successfully loaded here. So now I'm going to set here a new variable and it's going to be called df underscore premiere 21. And as you can see here, this belongs to the 21, 22 season because here in the date it says 2021. And also this is Premier League because the teams belong to the Premier League. You may know if you're familiar with this competition, but if you're not, it doesn't matter. So now let's continue. So here I'm going to set this data frame to this variable. So I press control enter and now I'm going to show here this data frame that we saw already. And now I'm going to rename some columns because some column names aren't so obvious. So maybe you will struggle to understand what this column means, for example and I'm going to rename some of them. So let's do it here fast. And we also practice that rename method. So here I'm going to copy here. Now I write the name of the data frame that rename open parentheses. And now we want to change the columns. So I write columns equal to then open the dictionary. And here the key is going to be, let's say we want to change only the these two columns. So I'm going to tell you what they mean. So here I can write the name of the column we want to change, then colon, then the value and now comma and now the second key or the second key value pair. So here is the second element. And now I'm going to paste this one. So here it's the second, you know, this first FTHG stands for final time home goals. So it means all the goals are scored by the home team. So I'm going to replace this name with the home underscore goals name. And here is final time away goals. So I'm going to write only away underscore goals. And that's it. Those are my new names. Now to update the column names, I'm going to write in place equal to true. Now I run this and now I'm going to show this data frame updated. So now this column is named home underscore goals and this one is away underscore goals. And that's it. In this video, we extracted a single CSV file for my URL with pandas. All right, now I'm going to show you how to extract tables from PDFs. So here I have a PDF and we're going to extract this table that you can see here so we can get this in another format.
For example, I'm going to export this table to a CSV format. So I'm going to leave this PDF in the description so you can also extract the table from this PDF. Okay, to extract tables from PDFs, we have to install a library called Camelot. So we open up the terminal and here we write pip install camelot pi. So you have to install this, but before you install this library, you have to install two dependencies, which are tk. So you write pip install tk and the other is ghost script. So you have to write pip install ghost script and install these two libraries. These are the two requirements before you install camelot. So once you have these libraries, we import camelot writing import camelot. So we write this and now we can start using this library. So first to read a PDF, we have to use camelot dot read underscore PDF. And here I'm going to write the name of this PDF, which is foo dot PDF. And then I'm going to specify which page I want. In this case, I want the first page and here you can add another parameter. For example, here there is the flavor parameter and this is the parsing method to use. This is set to lattice by default, but in case you fail to extract the table from your PDF, you can set it to a stream. So maybe with a stream, it works much better. So I'm going to leave it with a default value. And now I'm going to set this to a variable named tables. So equal to tables. And now let's see what's inside this tables variable. So I print these tables and now let's see the content. So here we see that we have a table list and we have n equal to one. And this represents that there is only one table in this page number one. And that's exactly what we have. There is only one table in our PDF. So great. Now let's export this table to a CSV file. So to do that, we have to write tables that export and then write the name of the CSV file we want to export to. So we write foo.csv and this is just a name I'm writing right now. And now I set the format to CSV and then set compress equal to true. Okay, now in case you have many tables, you want to pick one table in particular. In my case, I only have one table, so I'm going to pick the first table and I'm going to export the first table using tables with square brackets zero, which represents the first table. So now to CSV and now inside foo.csv. And with this, we export the first table to a CSV file. So now we only have to run this. And now in my working directory, I have a new file named foo.csv. So now I'm going to check it out. And as you can see here, I have the data and here is in CSV format. And we can verify that this is the same data I have before in the PDF. So it's exactly the same, but now in CSV format. And that's how you extract a table from a PDF. In this video, we'll learn some HTML basics that will help us when scraping a website. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language and is one of the most basic tools used to build websites. It defines the meaning and structure of web content. Although we're not going to build a website in this course, it's important for us to get familiar with the basics of HTML. This will help us understand the code behind a website. As a result, we will be able to find the best approach to scrape a website and get the data we want. Now let's review the HTML markup syntax. The first element in purple we see on screen is the tag. They are hidden keywords within a web page that define how a web browser must format and display the content. Most tags must have two parts, an opening and a closing part. For example, the h1 tag is the opening tag and h1 with the slash is the closing tag. Note that the closing tag has the same text as the opening tag, but has an additional forward slash character. A few tags like the img tag that stands for image are an exception to this rule because they don't need a closing tag. There are plenty of tag names and we'll review the essential tags for web scraping a bit later. The second element we see is the tag attribute. Attributes allow us to customize a tag 
and are defined within the opening tag. For example, the h1 tag contains an attribute named class. Attributes are often assigned a value using the equal sign. The attribute value in this example is title. Finally, we have the affected content, which is what we usually see in a website. It can be a text, for example, like a title of an article. It's cool like that because it's affected by the tag and attributes defined. So all of this is known as an HTML element or node. Great. So far, we've learned some of the basics of HTML. Now it's time to see some of the most important tag names for web scraping. So let's start with some of the most common tag names. The first is the head tag. This represents the head section and it's used mostly for metadata. Then we have the body tag. This establishes the body of an HTML document. And the third HTML tag you see on the screen is the header tag, not to be confused with the head tag. The header tag typically contains introductory content and layout that goes above the body. Let's see these three tags in action in a website that we're going to scrape later in this course. First, let's inspect this website. So right click and select the inspect button. After this, you should get the HTML code of the website. So scroll up and go to the head tag, as you can see on the screen. So this is the head, which doesn't represent anything at all. But if you go to the body, you'll see that all the website will be highlighted in blue. And then if you select the header, you'll see a section of the website highlighted in blue, which is where the logo goes. Next, we have the article tag. This tag is new in HTML5. And this tag can be used to contain blog entries, posts, etc. Then we have the P tag, which includes paragraphs in an article. And then we have the H1, H2, or H3 tag, which are level headings. So H1 is level 1 heading, which is the headline or title of a page. And H2 is the level 2 heading so the subtitle of a page and so on. In this website, we can see the article tag, the h1 tag and the p tag. So the first contains the whole article and h1 contains the title of that movie. And finally, the p tag contains the plot of the movie. The following tags you're going to see really often when scraping websites and you should at least recognize them to find the best way to scrape a website. First, there is a div tag, which is a divider or a kind of generic container. Then there is the nav tag, which is used for specifying a navigational region within a document, like the pagination bar. Then we have the li tag, which represents a list item with an order list or an order list. And then we have the A tag, A for anchor, also known as hyperlink or simply a link. To make an actual link using the A tag, we use the href attribute. For example, in this website, we see many movies listed in a table. We see that this is inside a UL tag, which contains a A tag, which is the anchor, and inside it is the li tag, which is the list item tag. As we can see, the a tag has the href attribute that contains the link that redirects to another page. So now you can see how they relate to each other in this HTML document. Let's see the last six tags I listed here. So first we have the button tag. So this one specifies a button that can be clicked. It's commonly used with forms. Then we have the table tag that is used for making tables in an HTML page. Then is that TD tag, which stands for table data. This represents a data cell within a table. Then we have the TR tag, which stands for table row element. This tag defines a row of cells in a table. And then we have the UL tag, which is an order list. This one is used with the li tag 
to make an order list. To see these last hacks in action, let's check this website that contains data inside rows in a table. So as you can see, here we have the tr tag, which represents a row, and then we have the td tag, which represents each element of data. Then I scroll up and I got the table tag, which is the whole table that contains a group of data. The last tag I want to show you is the iframe tag. This one makes it possible to embed another page within a page. In HTML5, this is known as nested browsing. This iframe thing makes sometimes web scraping a little tricky. So sometimes you have to switch between one frame to another frame, but that's not in all the websites. So you have to recognize whether the website you're scraping has multiple iframes or everything is contained in just one iframe. Before we start writing some code, let's review some HTML basics first. Here's the website we're going to analyze. I chose this website for its simplicity, so you can successfully scrape your first website. The website has three main sections, the title, the plot description, and transcript. Now let's have a look at its HTML code. Here I wrote a short HTML code version of the website that contains transcripts of thousands of movies. Now, if you've never seen HTML code before, you could still recognize some text elements like the title, description, and transcript. In this case, we're looking at the transcript of the movie Titanic, so that's why the title is there. Besides that element, something you will always see in HTML code are tags. Tags are those words surrounded by brackets. There are opening and closing tags. For example, in this HTML code, we have four tags, article, h1, p, and div. Each of them represent a node, and we'll see them in detail in the following tree structure. The tree structure will help us come up with effective ways to scrape a website and also will be the foundation for XPath that we'll use later in this course. Now let's start building this tree. The first element of the tree is the root. In this case, the root is the article element. As we've seen in the HTML code before, this article tag has an attribute called main article. This root element also contains the h1 tag that contains at the same time the text Titanic, which is the title of the movie. Another element inside the root is the p element. In this case, this has an attribute in a text. The attribute is named plot, and the text is the plot description. Finally, we have the div element. This element has also an attribute called full script and text with the transcript of the movie. All the rectangles you see on this tree are called nodes. Every node has exactly one parent, except the root. The h1 node's parent is the article node. Siblings are nodes with the same parent. An element node can have zero one or several children, but attribute and text nodes have no children. For example, p and div have two child nodes, but no child elements. Now, something very important in this tree is the attribute element, because they will determine the approach to take to scrape a website. In this example, you see only classes like main article, plot, and full script. However, you can also find IDs and others. In this video, we'll learn how XPath works. XPath is key to easily learn web scraping with Selenium and Scrapy. So let's start. XPath stands for XML Path Language. XPath is a query language for selecting nodes from an XML document. 
but we can also use it to select elements from HTML pages. Another way to select elements from websites is using CSS selectors. CSS stands for Cascadian Style Sheet. So it's a language that was mainly created to style HTML web pages. CSS and XPath have some similarities in their syntax. However, in this course, we'll mainly see how to select elements with XPath because of its simplicity. Now, let's review the XPath syntax. With XPath, we can select an element by using the double slash, and then we write the element name. This is the most basic way to locate an element or node. For example, if you want to select all the H1 elements in an HTML page, we do double slash H1. This double slash is a special character in XPath that means pick a matching node that is located at any level within the XML document. We're going to see the meaning of this in other special characters in detail in the next video. Now we can select an element based on its position by using the square brackets. Let's imagine that there are two H1 tags in the page. You will pick the first writing the XPath expression double slash H1 plus one inside square brackets. And you will pick the second H1 tag with double slash H1 and the number two inside square brackets. Now we can also specify the attributes, adding square brackets and writing inside the attribute name. This is the standard version of an XPath. It starts with double slash, followed by the tag name, square brackets, the at sign, and the attribute name like class, ID, and so on. Then we write the equal sign, then quotation marks, and inside the quotation marks, the attribute value. This is how we build an average XPath expression. We can also use some functions to find specific values. For example, the starts with function will search for text at the beginning, while the contain function will search for text included inside an element. In this example, I included the contains function inside the XPath expression. So, as you can see, we have to include parentheses to wrap the attribute name and attribute value. We also have to use the comma to separate the attribute name and attribute value instead of the equal sign. You can also use the AND or logical operators with XPath expressions. They should be placed inside the square brackets and every time you use operators, include a parenthesis for each XPath expression. We'll see how functions and operators work in action using a small HTML code in the next video. Now it's time to test some XPath expressions with this small HTML code we've been using so far. I'm gonna leave the HTML code I'm using with the link of this website in the description so you can play with it and understand how XPath works. So as you can see, this is a small HTML code of the Titanic transcript we've seen before. So this HTML code is gonna help us understand what we've learned of XPath so far. So as you can see, there is the title, the plot description, and the small transcript I wrote. So you can test the XPath expression in that bar. For example, I'm gonna write double slash and then write the tag name h1. So as you can see here, the result, it includes the h1 that is the title, Titanic 1997. And if I want the text, I can just write a slash and then text with parentheses. This is one way to get the text, but there are many ways to get text with selenium or with scraping. I'm going to show you how to do it later. So now, Let's test some other XPath expression. So let's try the P, which is the paragraph tag. So now I write P and I got two results because I included two plot elements. Now let's try double slash div 
and now let's get the text inside it so we get the transcript of this movie which is just a small phrase of the movie and now let's try some other expression so i write double slash and p so i get two results because i have two plots so if i want to specify one element in particular i have to open square brackets and inside i have to write the number so for example if i write one it means the first element or the first p element which is the first plot that contains 84 years later and if i write two it's the second plot that contains the text in the end and that's it so so now let's write div to test the average expat expression so now i write the add sign and then class and then open quotes and write full script so this is going to be the expat expression of the transcript element so this represents the full script element and we just use the expat expression with the div tag the class attribute name and the full script attribute value as we've seen before so now if i want the text i just write slash and text with parentheses and we just get the text now let's delete all the text values and just leave the the sign elements of the expat expression like the double slash the quotes square brackets and the add sign so this is the bones of the expat expression and now I'm going to write the p tag class and now the value plot. So as you can see I get one element because I just have one expat with these conditions and now let's test some logical operators. So to do so I'm going to include parentheses and then copy this, write or and then paste this expression. So I'm saying locate an element that contains the class plot or the class plot two so either one or the other so as you can see in the result i get two results that tell us that both elements satisfy these conditions now if i write and instead of or i will get no result because there is no element that satisfies both conditions so let's now try the contents function so i delete one expat expression and now just one remains so i'm going to write inside the square brackets the word contains and instead of writing the equal sign i'm going to replace it with the comma as you can see it says that at least it should have two arguments so i'm going to replace that equal sign with the comma so as you can see I get two results because both elements contain the word plot inside the attribute name so that's why I get two results this contains function will still work if I change the expat expression so let's change the p tag for div and also let's change the plot attribute value for script so now I get the transcript element which is the full script and that's how you use the contains function with expat expressions and that's it now it's your turn to test any expat you want with this html code now it's time to see some special characters that will come in handy when writing expat this lesson will be extremely useful to build robust expat expressions that will efficiently locate any element we want first we have the single slash character this one selects the children from the no set on the left side of this character in contrast the double slash specifies that the matching node set should be located at any level within the document for example if we write double slash article we'll get any descendant node in the html tree in this case the root is the only that matches now if i add slash h1 i get the immediate h1 element in this case the movie title if i add slash p i get the 2p elements and if i add slash div i get the transcript on the other hand 
If we want to get the text, we should write text in parentheses. However, if we add only a single slash, we won't get the text we want because it's not the child node of article. So what we have to do is to write first the element that contains the text. For example, if we write slash h1 before slash text parenthesis, we should get the title. Also, you can get the text using double slash text and parenthesis because double slash locates an element located at any level within the document. Then we have the that character. This specifies that the current context should be considered as a reference. So it refers to the present node. Then we have the double dots, which refers to a parent node. Sometimes it's difficult to find an element in a website, but if you find its children, you can use this special character to find the parent. Now I have a double slash h1 that matches the title. Let's see what happens if I add single slash and period. As you can see, I still get the same element because period returns the current node. However, if I write now period twice, the parent node will be returned. In this case, the parent node of h1 is article. Unfortunately, in this expat playground page, you can't see it clearly. But if we go to the actual page and inspect it, then press Ctrl F to text expat and write the same expat. So first double slash h1 and then add that twice. You will see that only the article element that is the parent node will be highlighted in green. Now we have the asterisk character, which is a wildcard character that selects all elements or attributes regardless of names. As an exercise, try to guess what these characters mean together. You can pause the video to figure it out if you want. So these characters together select all the children nodes considering the current context. This means that all the children elements will be matched. So this is the opposite of that double dot character that gives you the parent node. Now let's test the asterisk character. If I write double slash article and then slash asterisk, I'll get all the nodes inside article. So as you can see, there is the h1 node, the p node, and the div node that contains that transcript. Now as you can see, we obtain all the elements inside. Now if I add slash text parenthesis, I get all the text inside these elements. Finally, we have some characters we've already seen. So first, there is the add sign, which selects an attribute. Then we have the parentheses that it's used for grouping and expat expression. And the last one is the square brackets with the number inside, which indicates that the node with an index n should be selected. And that's it. You just learn many special characters. Use them wisely to build better expat expressions. To scrape websites with Selenium, first you have to download Chrome Driver and install Selenium. To download Chrome Driver, just go to chromedriver.chromium.org and in the download section, you will find this page. Here you will find the current releases of Chrome Driver and you have to choose the one that corresponds to the version of the Google Chrome you're using. To know which version is the right for you, just go to this three dots button on the upper right corner and click on it. And inside help, click on about Google Chrome. Here you will see the version of Google Chrome that you have installed. So in my case, I have installed version 92. So I'm going back to the other tab and now I'm going to choose Chrome driver 92. But in your case, you have to choose the one that corresponds to your Chrome driver. So I click on Chrome driver 92. Then you'll see options for different operating systems. So you'll see Linux, Mac and Windows. In my case, I have a Mac, so I'm going to download Mac 64. So I click on it and then it's going to start downloading the file. Once the file is downloaded, unzip the file and remember the path where you're leaving this file because 
we're gonna use this path later. Now it's time to install Selenium. So you can install inside PyCharm. So just open PyCharm and then go to the terminal located on the bottom. So click on it. And after that, just write pip install Selenium. And after this, just press enter. And after this, you'll have Selenium installed. Another way to install Selenium is just opening the terminal or the command prompt. In my case, I'm gonna open the terminal. And once you have the terminal, just activate your virtual environment and then write pip install Selenium. And press enter and then Selenium will be installed on your machine. And that's it. In this video, I'm going to show you how to automate this website so we can extract the titles and subtitles that you can see here in the news. So we're going to extract these titles and subtitles of each card so we don't have to visit this website every time we want to read the news, but we only check our TXT file and see the titles and subtitles and we can see which is the most interesting news for us. So let's go to PyCharm and the first thing we're going to do is to create a driver. A driver allows us to interact with this website through Selenium. So let's do this. So first we have to import web driver. So we write from Selenium import web driver. So that's the first thing we do and after that we have to make another import. So we have to write from selenium that web driver that chrome that service import service so in selenium 4 we have to make this extra import which is something we didn't need in selenium 3 but for selenium 4 which we're using right now we need this extra import so let's continue with this and now let's define the website and the path that we're using. So first the website that we're going to automate in this case is this website I chose which is all about football and I just copy and paste it. So here's the website and now the path. So the path is where you downloaded the Chrome driver. So in the previous video you downloaded a Chrome driver and you have to copy and paste the path of that file so just copy and paste it so i'm just gonna paste the path of my chrome driver here and now let's define the driver so i write driver equal to web driver dot chrome and open parentheses in previous versions of selenium that was enough to create a driver but on selenium 4 we have to do an extra step which is creating a service so here I'm going to write service equal to and here use this service that I imported here. So I just copy and paste and now I have to uh, write executable path equal to path. So this executable underscore path argument is equal to the path that we defined here. And after this, we have to define the service parameter inside this Chrome, uh, this Chrome method and equal to service. So basically it's first we define a service. Uh, we say executable path equal to path. And then we uh, define here in the service parameter, we set it this equal to service, which is this one that we defined before. And now we can open a driver by writing driver.get and inside parentheses we write website. So driver.get website and if we run this we're going to open a Chrome driver or just the Chrome browser as you can see here. Here it says that Chrome is being controlled by automated test software and this is not the, the browser I had before. The one I opened before that I showed you before is here. So this is the one I opened manually uh, with Chrome, but this one is one that the one that Selenium opened uh, by itself, so automatically. So we're gonna automate this 
uh, this website and we're going to do that on the next video. All right, in this video, I'm going to show you how to extract the title and subtitle of this news. So first to extract that title and the subtitle and all the data in any website that you visit, you have to right click on any blank space and select that inspect option. So I select on inspect and now we have this developer tools open. So this tab that we just opened is developer tools. And here it contains all the HTML elements that is behind this website. So you can see here that we have many elements and they represent uh, the elements in the website. So now I'm going to click on this option or this button on the left, the one that is here, and I'm going to select a specific element that I want. So here, let's select this element that is here uh, on the right that I'm, I'm uh, hovering on right now. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to click on this element that is here on the left, and then I'm going to drag to this element that is here. So this is a card of a news and there are many. So I'm going to choose this one in particular just to work with this. So I click and now we have this element in blue. So it's selected this in the developer tools and this indicates that this is the HTML element that is behind this card. And as you can see, every card contains a title and a subtitle and this one here too contains a title and a subtitle and this one, the big one here, also a title and a subtitle. And now let's check out other elements here in the developer tools. So we have now this element in blue, but we can go up and see this div element. So we have before this A element, but here we have now the div element. And this one represents, I think, the footer of this news. And if we go up, we can see let's say a, a small container that only contains the title and subtitle. And if we go up, we see the container that only contains the image of the news. So basically that's how it works. And also here, this is the element, let's say the parent element, and this one contains the whole thing. So I'm going to use this one in particular to locate this card and not only this one, but all these cards because they represent or they have the same pattern. So I'm going to build an expat that locates this element. And to do that, we have to press control F here in developer tools. And once we press this, we have this option that allows us to find an element by its expat. So here we have to build the expat, which basically consists of a tag, a attribute, and the attribute value. And now let's create this XPath. So I'm gonna copy the attribute value because it's a bit long and I might forget. And now to create this XPath, I only have to write double slash, then the name of the tag, which is div, then open square brackets. And here I uh, write this at sign and then the name of the attribute, which is class, then equal to, double quotes or single quotes. And now I paste the element that I had before. And as you can see, this element is now highlighted in green. Now, this is great. We have the whole card selected, but on second thought, I think it's much, much better if we only select the text, because here now we have not only the text, but we have the image of the news, but we only want the text because that's what we're going to extract. So to do that, I'm going down here and this one represents the, the image as you can see here. And I'm going down one more time and this element represents only the text. So I'm going to replace the value of this attribute and I'm going to paste it here. So we only obtain that element and not the whole thing. So here I paste it and now I have this element, which is, well, first we have this one because this is the first element on the on the website. And then we have this one. So this is the one we're working with. And well, 
we also have this one and this one. And by the way, here in this option, we can navigate through all the elements that were found. So as you can see, not only this element represents this XPath, but also all the news that you can see in this website. So let's go back to this one. And as you can see here, we only have the title and the subtitle. So only the text. Great. Now let's copy this XPath and let's go back to PyCharm. And what I'm going to do is paste this XPath. And now I'm going to write driver that. And here I'm going to use a method called find element. So I choose this one and this has two parameters by and also value, which I just wrote here. So by and value. The first one is the method that we're using to locate this element. And in this case, it's an XPath because we just build the XPath as you can see here. And in the value is the value of the XPath. So I'm just going to copy and paste. And well, it's here, but as you can see, there is a conflict because we use uh, double quotes here for this XPath and also here for the value. So it's like conflict. So I'm going to press Ctrl Z and I'm going to use single quotes to avoid that conflict. So now I paste and we have this. So this is great. Now we have uh, this element and with this, we are supposed to get the element that is here. So the text title and subtitle. Here there are different methods that you can use. You can also use the ID or the class or any other attribute, but we're going to use mostly XPath in this course. Great. Now, before we move on here, we have to modify this method. So we shouldn't use find element because here, if we use find element, we're going to get only the first element in this website. So as you can see here on the bottom, there are 50 elements that were found with this XPath. So we can navigate here with this, uh, with these arrows, we can navigate from the first element to the last element. And if we use only find element in singular, we're going to get only the first element in this list. So this one, the one that you see right now. So this one here, that's the only element that we're going to get. And we don't want that. We want all the elements in this uh, website that all the elements that were found. So to do that, we have to use uh, the find elements method. So in plural with the S. So now we're going to get all the elements that are found with this expat. So great. Now we have this and I'm going to set this equal to containers. So this is my variable. And now let's move on here. And now that we have this expat, I'm going to show you something else that we can do. So let's go back to the element that we had before, which is this one. And great. Now we have this element, which is in green. And we have the whole, let's say the whole uh, container, but we only want the title or we want the title and subtitle separately. So we don't want to extract them together, but in different variables. So what we have to do is just to open this uh, element here, we can click here and open the elements that are inside this element. So to see the children of this element. So we open this one and we see that there is this A element and we still don't get the title and the subtitle separately. So we click one more time here and now we have this H2 and this P. And we can see that this H2 represents the title and the P represents the subtitle. With this, we can get the subtitle and the title separately. So we only have to build the expat. And to get to these elements and to get this expat, we only have to add this slash, which says, hey, give me the immediate note. And we only have to write the A because uh, the A is the immediate note that follows this div. So we have to write A. And as you can see here, we have this uh, a followed by this div. So it's like a sequence. We have first the div and we have now the A. Now we write this slash again. And now we have to get to this H2 because this one represents the title. So we write slash 
and now one more time we write h2 so this is basically the sequence first is div then is a and then is h2 and we use this single slash because we want to get only the the immediate node so everything is perfect so div a and h2 and if we navigate here with these arrows we can see that we get all the titles in this website so everything is perfect so let's just copy this xpath and now let's paste it here on pycharm so i'm gonna paste it and i'm gonna comment this out okay now to get to this uh, title element i'm gonna use driver and i'm gonna use find element so now again we write by and we write value and now we write again xpath and now we paste that xpath that we just built so it's here i paste it so now i write single quotes to avoid any conflict and we have this so as you can see this xpath and the previous one we built has something in common which is this one that i'm selecting right now so this is the same as this and there is nothing wrong if we leave this as it is because it's correct but we can improve the syntax of this code so what we can do here is to reduce this containers variable so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna look through this list by the way i'm not sure if i mentioned this before but the difference between find element and find elements is that find element returns a single element but find elements returns a list and a list is an iterable so we can iterate through a list so we're using find elements and this returns a list so containers is a list that we can iterate through so uh, we write for container in containers colon and now we can put this inside that for loop so now we can use this container variable and we can replace this instead of driver so we can replace this with driver so we paste this one and now we have container that find element and basically this new let's say this new syntax is reducing this container uh, variable so now instead of writing all of this xpath we can only use the that sign and just replace all that xpath that we had before so this that represents this thing and we can use this that because we're using here also the container reference so this container is used as a reference for this new xpath so this is like a new syntax that you can use to avoid writing a long xpath as we had before great now let's find the xpath for the subtitle so here we have the xpath for the title which was here and now let's find the xpath for the subtitle so as you can see here the xpath for or the element for the subtitle is the one here that is inside the p tag so this p tag represents the subtitle and to get to this p element we only have to delete this h2 and only write p so as you can see now we have all the subtitles so the subtitle of this news now the next one and the next one and this one and this one too so it's great now we have all the subtitles of all the news listed in this website so now we only have to copy and paste it here comment this out and i'm gonna uh duplicate this line of code with Control d and now we have this so instead of writing the whole thing we can only write just delete this and p and let's compare this so first we have this and this is represented by the dot which is by the way this one which is exactly the same so then we have a which is here slash a and then slash p so this is the equivalent of this so great now we can delete this and now we have the subtitle element so far so good now let's go back to the website and i want to show you something here we have right now the subtitle element as you can see here but what happens if we only want the text 
because right now we have all these elements selected in green, as you can see. It's all this element with a tag name, with the attribute, and also this thing. But we only want the text, which should be in, in white, like this one, but it's in green right now because it's selected. So what if we only want the text and not the whole element? So if we only want to extract the text, which is in white here and is in black in the website, what we have to do is to use the text attribute. So let's go back to PyCharm and to get to the text, we only have to write that text. And this uh, returns only the text of this element. So we have this whole element that is in green and with the, that text, we only get the text inside this element. So we copy this one and we use it also for the subtitle. Great, now let's give a name to this uh, expression. So I'm gonna write title equal to this and now subtitle equal to this. So with this, we have the variable names and we can move on. All right, now the next element that we're gonna get is the links of each news. So here we have each uh, card and let's go here again to the card we saw. We have this card, for example, and what we want to do is to get the link. So we go directly to the website that contains this new. And as you can see, the link is here. It's inside the href. This is the link. So I'm going to just click on this link and now let's wait. And as you can see here, we have the news that corresponds to that card. So is the all the details about this, this news. And now I go back here and well, that's how we get to the link. And now we verify that that's the right link that we want. So now we have to build the expat that gets that link. So I'm going to delete this slash a and a slash p. And now we have only this. So to get to the, this href or to this link, we have to add the slash a that we had before. And this is the element that represents this whole, uh, let's say this whole description. And if we want to get to the link, we only have to use the href attribute. That, that's a method that we can use in PyCharm. So let's just copy this and let's go back to PyCharm. So I'm going to use again the container as a reference and again, find element. And here I'm going to use by and again, we're going to use the expat as a method and we're going to write value and here single quotes and the whole expat. So we don't need to use this part of the expat because we already have the container as a context. And OK, now we can get only the href. And to do that, instead of writing that text, for example, as we did before, we only have to use the get attribute method. So we write get attribute and inside we write the name of the attribute, which is href. As you can see here, the name of the attribute that contains the link is href. So we write href and with this we get the link. So we don't get the whole element, but we get only the link of this element. So now I'm going to define this as link equal to and that's it. Great. Now one little detail that I want to tell you here is that usually the links are inside href attribute. This is like something that you're going to see quite often. And also the href is inside an a tag. So you will usually see that the link are inside href attribute and also inside an a tag. So that's a typical element that you will see often. So the next time you want to get to a link, just look for the href or look for the a tag and you will get to the link fast. So now back to PyCharm and with this we have all the elements. So another detail that I want to mention is that here we're using find element and not find elements because here in this for loop we're iterating through each element of the list. So containers is a list but container is an element. So here is only a single element per iteration. So we only have to use find element because it's a single element. 
Great, in this video, we we'll learn how to locate all the elements that we wanted in the website. In the next video, we're gonna see how to export all these elements in a CSV file, and we're gonna use pandas for that. All right, in this video, we're gonna see how to export all the elements that we extracted to a CSV file. So first, what we have to do is to create empty lists. So I'm gonna create three empty lists. The first one is gonna be titles, and this one represents this title element. And now I'm gonna duplicate this, and the second one is gonna be subtitles in plural, and the third one is gonna be links. So I write links, and these are my three lists. Now what we have to do is append each element to a list in this for loop. So in each iteration, we're gonna append an element to this list. So we only have to write here titles and use the append method. So this append method allows us to append each element to the list. And we only have to write the variable that we want to append. So it's like this, titles.append and inside parentheses the element. Now I duplicate this and I'm gonna use only subtitles and I'm gonna use the same logic. So subtitles.append and subtitle. So this one is the list and this one is the element. And one more time, now links the list, append the element, which is link. So this is what we have and this is how we append each element uh, to the list. So in every iteration. Great, at this point, all the lists are filled with the elements in this iteration. So what we have to do now is build a data frame with these lists. And to create a data frame, we have to use a library named pandas. So I'm gonna write here, import pandas as pd, and probably you have to install this library. So go ahead and click on terminal, and here just write pip install pandas, then press enter, and you just have to wait some seconds to install this library. I already have this library installed, so I don't have to wait anything. So once you have pandas installed, you can write this, import pandas as pd. And now we can use the library pandas with this pd. So I write pd, and now I can use the data frame method. So now I can use the, uh, the data frame method and I can open these uh, curly braces and inside I can use a dictionary. So to show you this much better, I'm gonna create a dictionary so you don't get confused. So first I'm gonna write dictionary underscore uh, or just my dictionary. So my underscore dict and open here a dictionary. So as you might know, a dictionary consists of a key and a value. So the key is the one that is here on the left and the value is the one that is on the right. So the value, I'm gonna set it here to my variable, which is uh, titles. So our dictionary is gonna have three keys and three values. So the first value is titles and I'm gonna name this as titles too. There is nothing wrong if you set the name of the key as the name of the variable. But if you want, you can change it. For example, I can write only title. You don't have to write it the same way. You can change it a little bit or you can change it completely. You can choose. So now I'm gonna write the second element, which is the subtitles list. So here are subtitles and I'm gonna paste these subtitles and I'm gonna write just in singular, subtitle. That's the name of my key. And now the third one is links. So here, links, this is the name of the value. By the way, the name of the value obviously has to be the same as the, the one that we want here, that is, which is the list. And here I'm gonna write the name of the key, which is link, which I can choose right now. Great, now we can use this dictionary to create a data frame. So here I copy the name of that dictionary and I put it inside parentheses. And with this, we can create a data frame using this dictionary. So just a recap right now. First, we have these lists 
here, empty lists, we fill these empty lists with all the elements here in the, in the loop. And then now that we have all the elements inside these lists, what we have to do is to create a dictionary. So this dictionary has a key and a value and the name of the key, we can choose it, but the name of the value is the name of the lists. So with this, we have the dictionary and we created this dictionary to create a data frame. So we only write PD, that data frame, and inside we write my underscore dict. And with this, we have this data frame. So I'm gonna name this data frame and I'm gonna set it equal to DF underscore headline. So we have this data frame and now we can easily export this uh, to a CSV file using DF underscore headlines that to underscore CSV. So we're exporting to a CSV file. But there are other options like JSON and also Excel and HTML and different options. But I'm gonna choose CSV as you can see here. And now I'm gonna give a name to this file and it's gonna be headline dot CSV. And with this, the file is gonna be exported with this name. So great. Now to end all of this, we have to use driver.quit. So after we, we extract all this information and we export all of this to this CSV file, the driver is gonna be closed with this that .quit. Great, now let's test this out. So we right click and choose run. So I run this script and let's see what happens. So first Python is gonna open this driver uh, through Selenium and now it extracted the information and it closed the driver. So the script was successfully executed and now let's check if we have these headlines.csv here on our working directory. So here I open this and we can see that there is a file named headline.csv which is this one. So we were working in this folder named tutorial and this one is the file we just generated. So we double click on it and we can see that we have the title, the subtitle and the links. So now let's verify if this is correct. The first title is best of the best and the subtitle says who makes our Man City versus Real Madrid combined 11 and all of this. So let's check if that's the same here. And yeah, it says best of the best and who makes our Man City versus Real Madrid and all of that. So everything was successfully extracted and we also have the links. So we can visit any, uh, any news that is interested for us. We can go directly to the website and we can check all the news here without being distracted by all these images and all the ads on the website. Great, that's it for this video. On the next video, I'm gonna show you how to do all of this on the background. So you don't have to see that driver opened every time you run the script, but all will be run in headless mode. So far, we automated this website and extracted the titles and subtitles that you see here. And we did this with Selenium. So every time we run this code, we open this browser automatically and extracted all this data. That's great. But in this video, I'm gonna show you how to do all of this without opening this browser with Selenium, but doing this in headless mode. So we don't have to watch Selenium open this browser and do all the automation, but we can just do it in the background and we can let Selenium do that in headless mode. So let's go back to PyCharm and here we're gonna add some lines of code to activate headless mode. So to do that first, we write here from selenium.webdriver.chrome that options import options. This options is gonna help us modify the default behavior of Selenium. So now we add here some lines of code and first I'm gonna write here headless mode. So we know that this is the part that is gonna change. So here first we initiate uh, an instance of the options uh, class here. So I write options parentheses and here I write just equal to options. So this is just a rule of thumb. You have to initiate an instance and this is my options object. As you can see, I gave the same name 
to the name of this class. This is just like a convention. You use the same name, but here in lowercase. And this is my options object. So now I write options and to turn on headless mode, we have to use the headless parameter. So I write headless and this by default is set to false. So we don't use headless mode when we run this, um, this script because it's in false. But if we want to turn on headless mode, we have to set it equal to true. So it's equal to true now. And now we have to change this webdriver.chrome. So in addition to this service parameter, we're gonna add another parameter. And this time is gonna be options. So this options has all the default parameters that Selenium works with. So Selenium has some default behavior and we can change it here with the options parameter. So I'm gonna set options equal to options and there it is. So as you can see, I use this uh, name variables just to make my life easier. You can set any other name to this options variable. You can set it uh, like options one, two, three, and you can write here options one, two, three. It doesn't matter. I just name my variables like this to make my life easier. Uh, here too, service equal to service. You can use a different name for service here, but I just name it service in lowercase. All right, now something you need to know is that we can make different changes to the default behavior of Selenium, but one of the most uh, popular is headless mode. Later in the course, we'll see another things that we can add to this options uh, object so we can modify the behavior of Selenium even further. So now let's continue with, this, uh, with these changes. Everything is ready to run this script in headless mode, but I'm gonna make a little change here in the end. So instead of naming this CSV file as headline, I'm gonna name it headline.headless. So we know that this comes from this script, which is the one we're using with headless mode. So headline, uh, this dash headless, and now it's ready. Let's run this script and see the results. So let's wait a couple of seconds. And the difference with the previous script is that here we're not gonna open a browser automatically with Selenium as we did in the previous video, but all is gonna be done in headless mode, so in the background. Here uh, we got a message that everything was successfully and now I'm gonna close this one and see if we have this file headline headless so I go here and I check here it says headline hyphen headless and we have all this data so it's the title the subtitle and the link again but everything was done with headless mode so let's verify the first uh, the first title subtitle and here it says Pep Idol, Watch Guardiola, Star Reaction to Benzema's Penalty. So let's go here. And this is the first section that we are working with. And yeah, we got the same Pep Idol, Guardiola's Reaction to. So great. You can verify if all that news was uh, properly extracted. I did it myself and everything is working fine. So that's it for this video. In this video, we'll learn how to automate this website and extract all this data in headless mode. All right, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to schedule this script to run every day or every time of the day you want. So for example, this news, we can schedule to run every morning. So every time we turn on the computer, you'll have the CSV file with all the data automatically extracted. So you don't have to do it yourself, but you can schedule when that's gonna be executed. So to do that first, we have to convert our pi file. This is a pi file because this is Python. So the extension is that pi. And we have to turn this pi file or, or convert this pi file to an executable. So we have to do that first, but before we do that, we have to make some modifications to our script. 
So we have to prepare our script to work properly before we turn our pi file into executable. So to do that, we're going to do some importation. So we write from daytime import daytime. This is the first. The second is import OS. This help us like interact with the operating system. For example, we can create folders and other things. And the last one is sys. I didn't explain to you what date time is. This helps us manipulate the date and time. So for example, we can extract the hour or the day when the script is executed. So that's it. That's all the modules or libraries we have to import. And now let's do some changes. So first, we have to use the OS module and get access to the path attribute and then write your name and use sys.executable. What we're doing here is get the path of the executable that we're going to create. So far we have a pi file, but we're doing this for the executable that we're going to create in the next video. So with this, we're saying get the path of the executable that we're going to create. And here we only get access to the path. This is the attribute of the OS module. And well, this is the directory name. And let's give this a name. I'm going to name this application underscore path. So my application is my executable file that we're going to create. And this is the path. So we know what's the path of this executable. We do all of this because when we work with executable files, it's a bit messy to work with paths. Sometimes uh, the path you don't know where goes the file that you have here. So right now we export all this data in this CSV file and this CSV file is exported in our working directory. This is fine because we're working with a pi file, but when we work with an executable file, things get a bit messy and we don't know sometimes where the file is actually exported. And with this, we're going to be able to export the file in the same folder where our executable file is going to be located. So it's going to be in the same folder and we're not going to have any problem with the path. So that's why we do this. Next, we use the daytime, um, this daytime to customize the name of our file. So right now is just headless or headline headless.csv. But if we run this every morning, we're not going to know which file corresponds to which day. So for example, if it's a, a Saturday in the weekend and we didn't check the news from Monday to Friday, we wouldn't know if this file is from Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday and so on. So just to customize the name of the file that is going to be exported, we have to create a, a variable that indicates which day is the day when this script or this executable is going to be executed. So now to do that, we write daytime that now parentheses. And this is equal to, well, I'm just going to name it now. And with this, we have the date uh, right now, according to my machine or my computer. So now we have to use a method called strf time. This stands for a string from time. And basically what we're going to do is to get the time in a string format. So here, this null variable is in time format and we're going to convert this time data into a string so we can customize and format this this time. So here inside you have to write the format that is used in this uh, by this strf time method. I didn't explain the syntax of this or the format of this, but it's quite simple. I'm going to this website, which is right here, which is named as the method strf time. You can go visit this website and you can check the format that I was talking about. So for example, what I want to create here is a format that is 
um, let's say day or month, day and year. So I'm going to extract just this uh, percentage M. I just copy and paste it. Then I said I want, sorry, this was month with the M, then D. So I'm going to extract this. Uh, where is the D? It's here. So I just copy and paste percentage D and finally the year, which is going to be percentage Y. So this is the year. So with this, we have month, day and year as I show you here. So this is the, the, the format that we have to use. You only can copy here and paste it as I did it. Now I'm going to give this a name and I'm going to name it month. Well, just as simple as this month, day, underscore year. And I'm going to put this here on the right. So with this, we have this variable and this variable is going to help us customize our file name. So now let's go here. Let's go uh, to this section and I'm going to use a F string to customize this string. So I only write F in front of this string. And now to add a variable or to concatenate a variable, I have to use uh, the curly braces. So with curly braces, we can concatenate a variable. So I'm going to copy the name of the variable and I'm going to paste it here. So I paste it and actually I'm going to change this name. I want it to be just headline. So headline hyphen and this. So with this, we're going to get something like, like that, something like headline hyphen uh, Tuesday or well, in this case numbers. So one or zero one zero four two thousand twenty two something like that just following this format month day and year so with this we get this csp file with a date that we want and now what we have to do is to use this uh, application path because i told you that the path is a bit messy when we work with executable so we're going to include this path here and an easy way to do this is just adding these curly braces for a variable and just pasting this and adding the slash. And as you can see, this is the typical format we use for a path, right? We use this slash and that's how we uh, put two paths together. So we put this path and this and we get the whole path. But this is not a good, uh, a good practice because this slash is also a bit messy between operating systems. Sometimes um, different operating systems use like different slash. So for example, Mac OS, I think uses this forward slash, but Windows, I believe uses this backwards slash. So it's like a bit messy. You can uh, find some problems if you use this slash. So what we do is work with the OS module to avoid this slash. So we use um, the OS and we use the join method to avoid writing this slash ourselves. So what we do is write OS that path that join. And here we have to add the path we want to concatenate. So before I do this, I'm going to create a name for this um, first, I'm going to delete this because I'm not going to do this. You can do it. It's going to work fine, but you have to be careful with the slash. So I'm not going to do this just to follow a best practice. And what I'm going to do is I copy this and now I create a variable file underscore name just to be more organized. You don't have to do this. I just like to be organized. So file name and now I copy file name and I put it here. So this is the file name. And now to concatenate this, I'm going to write this and concatenate it with application underscore path. So basically this is the same. We're concatenating this application path with this 
file name. So we're not using this slash anymore or this backward slash anymore, but we're letting this OS path join taking care of it. So we don't run into any issue. So now this is ready and I'm going to name this as final underscore path. So this is my final path and this is what we're going to work with. So oh, I delete this by mistake, but everything is fine now. So now I add this final underscore path. So I copy this and paste it. So this CSV is going to be sent to this path. This path is where the executable is going to be located. So we avoid any issue with the executable and paths. And that's it. With this, everything is ready to convert our Py file to executable file and then run this executable file at any time we want. And we're going to do that in the next video. Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to schedule this script so you can run it every morning or every day you want at any time you want. So the first thing we have to do is to open up the terminal. I have the terminal here on PyCharm uh, on the bottom. So I just click here, terminal. And here, what we're going to do is first install a library called PyInstaller. So PyInstaller is going to help us convert a Py file. So Py file are Python files to executable. So the first step to, to schedule this script is to convert it to an executable file. And once we have the executable, we can schedule this executable to be run anytime we want. So to install this library, we only write pip install by installer. So you just have to write this, press enter and wait a little bit. So here I got a message that I have this library already installed, but it's going to take you a couple of seconds to install this library. Okay. Once this is ready, we just clean this up and now we write the following command. So we write py installer double uh, dash, and then we write one file. So this is the command and then we have to write the name of this, um, this pi file. So this is script. In my case, I name it news dash headlines. So I just have to write this name and I'm going to press tab. And as you can see here, I have this, uh, this script and I'm just going to write news dash headline. And one little detail I forget to mention is that you have to be located on this folder. So on the folder where the, the Python file, the, this Py file is located. So you have to do that on the terminal. Here we're right now on the terminal. And to do that, first I'm going to copy this so I don't lose this command. And to do that, you have to know how to navigate on the terminal. And on the terminal, we navigate with this command cd which stands for change directory. So if you are not on the folder where is your pi file, this is not going to work. So you have to use CD and then for example, I'm going to use CD to go to the previous folder. And right now I'm on another folder. You can see here, this is the parent folder of tutorial, which is the folder where is my pi file. And I can verify it because if I do CD, I can see the folders that are inside this one. So I write CD and then press tab and you can see all the folders. And one of them is the tutorial folder, as you can see here. So to go into this folder, I only have to write CD and then write tutorial. So I have this, I press enter. And as you can see, I'm not anymore on the football headlines folder, but I'm right now on the tutorial folder and this tutorial folder happen to have this, uh, this um, script that I need. So this is the, the script which I need, which I name news dash headlines. So perfect. So now I'm going to clean this and now I'm going to uh, delete CD and I'm going to use the previous, uh, the previous command I had, which I copied. Yeah, is this one. And well, it says pie installer, double double dash 
one file and the name of my pi file. So this is ready. I'm going to press enter to convert this pi file to executable. So I press enter and now we have to wait some seconds. Great. I get the message that building the executable was completed successfully. So now to verify this was successful, we have to go to the folder where this is located. So I'm going here to the left and here this is my tutorial folder and in your folder you will see these two folders. One is called build and the other is dist and your executable is in the dist file. So this is my dist file and this is my um, Python script but now it's an executable. So on a Mac what you can do to test this executable which I highly recommend you is to double click on it and just after you double click you'll see that the executable will be run. But sometimes when it's the first time you open this sometimes you won't see this option to open with the terminal because right now my operating system recognizes that this should be open with the terminal but sometimes it doesn't know so what you have to do is to help it so you have to right click and click on open with and sometimes you will see the option terminal but if you don't see it you just click on order and then you have to locate the terminal so you just click here all applications then scroll all the way down go to utilities and here it should be the terminal so here i'm going to open with the terminal I didn't have to do it, but I just did it to show you how this works. So now I have this uh, executable. I just run this executable by double clicking on it. And here, and well, the executable apparently is running. And we can verify if this is successful by going here to PyCharm, or actually we can see right here. So we can see here in the folder, and we see that we have a new file. And this file is named headline dash and here is today's date. So 04-28-2022. And this is the format that we just here for the CSV file, month, day, and year. So we verify that this file was successfully created. So we have here the file. And if we check the content, we'll see that is the title and also the subtitle and also the link. Well, we verify that everything is working fine and I highly recommend you to verify that the executable was successfully created because once we schedule this, you'll have to wait until the moment that you schedule to verify if this is working fine. So it's much better if you test it out right now as I did some seconds ago. Now we're going to schedule when this is going to be run. So now I open up a new terminal. So I click on new window and here to schedule this executable, we have to open Chrome tab. So we write Chrome tab, then dash and then E. We press enter and we're going to get this window. And here we have to write a command to schedule this executable. And the command has the following format. To show you the format, I'm going to this website, which is called Chrome Tab Guru. And here you can build a part of the command. So here you can uh, know the syntax used by this Chrome Tab. So here I previously tested the syntax. So I'm just going to leave it as uh, the default parameter. So here you see five asterisks and the first represents the minute, the second, the hour, the third, the day the fourth the month and the fifth the day on the week. And here, let's say we want to schedule this executable to be run at nine in the morning every day. So if we want that, we only uh, delete this and write here zero because it's zero uh, in the morning. I mean, the minute is zero and the hour is nine. So at nine in the morning. So this hour is uh, from 0 to 24 or 23, I guess. So we have to write 9 and this indicates is 9 in the morning. So it's saying at 9. And here we can also see when is the next time when this is supposed to run. So it's 28th, which is the date today, then 29, then 30, 
uh, one the next month and the second of the next month. So we have here, we can verify which days this is supposed to, to run. So this is really good because you have to be very careful when you create uh, this command because by mistake, you can make it like to run every minute or run every hour and you might damage the performance of your computer. So be very careful and check out the expression that you're creating here. So I'm going to copy this and now I'm going to paste it here. Okay, this is the first part of my command and the second is the path of the executable file. So here we have to go here to my folder and we have to drag this file to the terminal to get the path. So here first I'm going to press the I key to go to insert mode. So here I'm in insert mode and I can type anything as you can see here. So we're in insert mode and here I'm going to paste this or I'm going to drag this file. So I drag just to get the path. So that's how Mac OS works. So here we have this path and this is the second part of this command. So first we have to write the hour that we want or the time we want this to run. And then we have to paste the path of this executable. So everything is ready here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this command. And to do that, we have to press the escape key. So I press escape. And now we have to press this colon that you see on the bottom and now W and Q. So W stands for write and Q stands for quit. So we want to write this and then quit this cron tab. Now I press enter and we're going to get this window and we have to press OK to give permission. So I press OK and now this was successfully created. And to verify this, we have to write the command cron tab dash L. So we're going to list all the commands that were created. So I press enter. And now you see that one of the commands created is the one we just created a second ago. So this is the command we created. And with this, we're telling uh, our operating system that we want to run this executable at nine in the morning every day. So I'm not going to wait until nine in the morning because it's going to take too much. And we already tested out this executable file manually. So we know that this is working just fine. So you can schedule this to be run uh, earlier in your computer and verify it yourself. Or you can test this out manually as I showed you before. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll learn how to schedule an executable file to be run at any time you want. Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to create pivot tables using Python. So here we have the typical sales data that we have to work with in Microsoft Excel. So we usually have to create pivot tables using Excel. But now we're going to create a pivot table using Python. And in this case, we're going to create a pivot table that tells us how much people spend in each product line. So we're going to divide uh, by gender male and female, and we're going to see how much each gender is spent in product line. So we're going to do this with Python. And first we have to read this Excel file. So I'm going here and we have to use pandas as usual. So I import pandas as PD. And then to read this Excel file, we have to use read underscore Excel. So this is an Excel file because here we have the XLSX extension. So that's why I'm using read Excel and not read CSV. So now I just have to write super market underscore sales that XLX X. And well, this is the name of the file. And now I'm going to set a name to this. So DF equal to, and with this, we have the data frame. So we read this Excel file and we put this inside a data frame. So with this, we're reading this Excel file. So now if you want, we can print this. So I print this data frame and now we'll see the result. And well, here I didn't write the name correctly. So I didn't write supermarket. So I write, 
I write supermarket now and we have here the data frame. And as you can see, we got here the same data that is on the left, but now is here printed in PyCharm. So now to make a pivot table, what we have to do is use the pivot underscore table method. So what we have to do is write df that pivot underscore table, and then we have to indicate the index, the columns, and the values for this pivot table. Great. And now I'm going to show you the columns that we're going to work with. So these are the columns in yellow. So the gender column, the product line column, and the total column. So I'm going to select these columns so we only see these three columns in our data frame. So to do that, first we have to write df, which is the name of our data frame, and then write double square bracket to select multiple columns. So to select one column, we write just a pair of square brackets. And if we want to select multiple columns, we have to write double square brackets. So now we indicate the columns that we want to select. So in this case is the gender column, then is the I think product line column. So I just copy this one. And finally is the total column. So total. So with this, we have the three columns that we wanted. So now I can set df equal to this. And now my data frame will have only these three columns. So if I print this, you'll see that we only have three columns. And these are the columns that we selected. So this is a good practice when you only want to focus on some columns and you don't want to see all the columns that is in the file. Great. Now let's continue with our pivot table. So I have here the pivot table and we have to define which are the index, the columns and the values. So first, what we have to do is remember the goal of this pivot table. So the goal is to see how much each gender is spent in each product line. So if that's our goal, probably we want the gender in the index and we want the product line in the columns. And also we want to sum the amount of money spent on each product. So now let's define the parameters. First, the index. So index is going to be the gender. Then the column is going to be the product line. So I said here product line. Then we have the values. And as I said before, this is going to be the amount of money. So this is going to be total. And finally, we have the aggregate function that we want to apply. So in this case, we have to write agg func. And this is the operation that we want to apply. So in this case, I want to sum. Okay, with this, our pivot table is ready. And now I only have to set this equal to, and I'm gonna name this pivot underscore table. So that's the name of my pivot table. And well, now I'm just going to put this here. And well, this is ready. And now I'm gonna print this pivot table so you can see its content. So print pivot underscore table. So now I run this and let's see the result. So here we have our pivot table. And as we can see, we successfully built this pivot table. So in the index, we have the gender, male and female. Then in the column, we have the product line. So there are different product line, electronic accessories, sports and travel, and so on. And finally, in the values, we have the numeric data that was in the total column. So here we have this numeric data. And well, we use the sum as our aggregate function. So we sum the values in each category. And now to see the content of this pivot table much better, I'm going to export this pivot table in an Excel file. So what I'm going to do is delete this. And here I'm going to export this pivot table using two underscore Excel. And then I'm going to set a name for this Excel file. So I'm going to set it equal to pivot underscore table dot X lsx and we can also set the name of the sheet in this case i'm going to name the sheet as report so this is the name of my sheet and then we can also set in which row this data is supposed to be exported so we only have to add the start row parameter and in this case i'm going to export this in row number four and with this this pivot table is going to be exported in an xlxx file and the first sheet is going to be named report and this is going to export it in row number four. 
And by the way, you can also round the numbers inside this pivot table. So you only have to write here that round and zero. So with this, you round the numbers inside this pivot table. So now I run this. So now I should have this file in my working directory. And since I don't have Microsoft Excel in my computer, I'm going to open this in Google Sheets. Okay, I just opened this file and well, it's named pivot underscore table is an Excel file and I just opened this in Google Sheets. And well, this pivot table was exported in the row that we specified and we see that the sheet is named report here on the bottom. And that's it. We successfully created this pivot table with Python and we exported this into an Excel file. In the previous video, we used this sales data to create this pivot table with Python. And now we're going to use this pivot table to create a bar chart. And to do that, we're going to use a library called OpenPy Excel. So first we go here and we open the terminal and we install OpenPy Excel. So we only have to write pip install OpenPy Excel. So now we press enter and with this, we're going to install this library and this library is going to help us do things we will do in Microsoft Excel, like creating charts or summing values in columns and more things. So now let's import this library. So I write from open PyExcel import. And the first thing we're going to import is load underscore workbook. And we're going to use this load underscore workbook to read our Excel file. So the name of my Excel file is pivot underscore table. So now I use this load underscore workbook and here I write the name of the file. So I write pivot underscore table dot X LSX. And now I set this equal to WB, which stands for workbook. And now I'm going to select the sheet I'm going to work with. So to do that, I have to write wb and then open square brackets and then we have to write the name of the sheet in this case i'm going to use the sheet report which is here so the name is report and now i only have to write report and this is the name of my sheet so i set this equal to sheet all right with this we have the workbook and we also have the sheet and now we can use these two variables to manipulate our file okay now what we're going to do is select the active rows and columns that are in our sheet. So here we have some active rows and columns, and this is determined by the cells where our pivot table is located. So here we see that our pivot table is located between A5 and G7. So we have to locate the minimum row, the minimum column, the maximum row and the maximum column. So let's do this. So I go here and now we use WB and then we have to use the active attribute. So I write active and first let's locate the minimum column. So I write that min underscore column. So now I duplicate this and now I do the same, but now with the maximum column. So now maximum column, then minimum row and then maximum row. So now I set this equal to and I'm going to set just names that are equal to this. So first minimum column, then maximum column and so on. So now with the minimum row and finally with the maximum row. So now we have these four variables and now I'm going to print these four variables so you can understand much better what they mean. So first the minimum column and well, then maximum column then minimum row and maximum row. These four variables are going to be useful when we make our bar chart. So we get one, seven, five, and seven. So for minimum column, we get one and for maximum column seven. So let's go and check here. So minimum column one. So that's correct because the minimum column is a, which represents one and the maximum column where our pivot table is located is G. So it's two, four, five, six, seven. So yeah, maximum column seven. So minimum one and maximum seven. So that's correct. And then we have minimum row and maximum row. So five and seven. So 
Now let's check here and the minimum row uh, is five and the maximum is seven. So this is based where our pivot table is located right now because this is the only element that is in our sheet. So that's why this is our reference. All right, now that we have these minimum and maximum values, we're gonna use these values to create our bar chart. So first I delete this and now I'm gonna import a bar chart from OpenPyXL. So I write from OpenPyXL.chart import bar chart. And now I'm gonna instantiate a bar chart object. So I write bar chart and open parentheses and this is equal to bar chart. So now I have this bar chart object and now we have to do this. First, we have to import a reference and this reference is gonna have the minimum and maximum value. So I write here, comma reference. So I'm gonna use this reference and then I'm gonna put inside parentheses the minimum and maximum values. Okay, so first let's indicate the sheet we're working in. So first sheet and then we have to indicate the minimum and maximum values. So here I write min column or min underscore cool and then I write min column and I do the same for the other. So I only have to duplicate and add comma. So here I add commas, but we have to change here to maximum column and then to minimum row and finally to maximum row. And with this, we have the four parameters and now I just have to change the values. So minimum column, then maximum column, then minimum row and finally maximum row. So, okay, now this are the reference, but now we have to split the reference in two. So first we have the data, this is the data, and then we have the categories. This is the categories. So we have to create two references. So let's start with the data. So first we have the data, and I'm gonna set this equal to data. So I write equal to data, and well, now I'm just going to format this properly, and then I'm gonna explain you how this works. So first I'm gonna put this in one line so you can see it much better. And okay, now we have to make a little change to this reference and I'm gonna explain you why. So here we have minimum column, maximum column, minimum row and maximum row. But these are the minimum and maximum values of the whole pivot table. So here we have the whole pivot table and the minimum value, as I told you before, is A, so one. But for the data, the minimum value is V, so number two, and the maximum value is still G, so seven. So the minimum column is two and the maximum is seven. So here, what we have to do is write minimum column plus one. So here, I have to add plus one. And as I told you before, the maximum column is gonna be the same because it shares the same maximum column with the pivot table. So it's the same maximum column. And then in the rows, the minimum and maximum row, you can see that the, the data in yellow has the same minimum and maximum row uh, compared with the pivot table, so it's the same. So right now we're analyzing the area in yellow. And it has the same minimum and maximum row compared to the whole pivot table. Okay, so the only thing that changed was the minimum column because it starts in B. So here we added minimum column plus one. Okay, now let's do the same, but now for the, for the categories. So now I write categories and here I'm gonna delete this and let's analyze. So the categories, are in green. So the minimum column is still A, that's correct, but the maximum column is not G anymore, but is still A. So here, what we have to do is write in maximum column the value of minimum column. So the minimum and the maximum column are gonna be min underscore column. Okay, so now let's see the minimum and maximum row. So the minimum row 
is not 5 anymore, but is 6. And the maximum row is 7. So here, what we have to do is add minimum row plus 1. Because minimum row is the reference of the whole pivot table. So 5 plus 1, 6. So here, I go and add plus 1. And the maximum row is going to be still 7. So it's going to be the same. It shares the maximum row with the whole pivot table. So it remains the same. And here I will leave it as max underscore row. And with this, we have the references for our data and the category. Just one little detail you need to know here. I highlighted these two areas in yellow and in green. So you can know which are the data and which are the categories. But this is the same concept that you will follow in any pivot table. So the categories are going to be always on the left here. And this doesn't include the header, so not this one. And the data does include the header. So in the data, we include the numeric data, which is right here. And also we include the headers. So you have to follow the same concept. All right, now let's create a bar chart. So now that I have the references, I'm going to use this bar chart object. So I just copy bar chart. And now I'm going to use a method called add underscore data. And we already have the data. So the data is here in my data variable. So I only have to add data. And then we have to indicate where we want to create this bar chart. So I'm going to create this in the cell B12. And well, with this, our bar chart is going to be created in B12. All right, now let's add a title to this bar chart and then let's add a style. So first, let's add the title. So I write bar chart that title and we set this equal to and we can write anything we want for our title. In this case, I'm going to write sales by product line because this is what our bar chart is about. So sales by product line and then I'm going to change the style. So I'm going to write that style. And this is basically the style that our bar chart is going to have. So when we create charts in Microsoft Excel, we have different styles, so different colors and different shapes. And we can select here only with numbers. So for example, we can use style number one, style number three, or style number five. So for now, we can only guess the number and then we can see the results when we export this bar chart. All right, now let's save the results. So I write WB, which stands for workbook, and then save. So that's save, and I'm gonna export this as bar chart dot XLSX. So with this, we're gonna save all the results in this Excel file. So now what I'm gonna do is run all of this and see the results. So I run this. Well, we got a message of success. But before I open the file here, I made a little mistake. Here, I forgot to add the categories. So we created categories, but we didn't add it to the bar chart. So here, I'm going to write here bar chart that set underscore categories. And inside, I'm going to put these categories that we created. So I put this inside. And here, we also, this shouldn't be here. This B12 shouldn't be here. Sorry, this should be in another method. So first we add data and we add categories to our bar chart. And then once this is done, what we have to do is write sheet that add underscore chart. And then we put our bar chart here. So I'm going to write bar chart and then I'm going to set the cell where we want this bar chart to be added. So I set this equal to B12. And this bar chart is going to be added in B12. So just a recap. First, we add the data and the categories to our bar chart. And then we use the add underscore chart method to indicate where we want to add this bar chart. Okay, now I'm going to add just one more parameter here. So I'm going to add title from data and here equal to true. So we have the title from data in this uh, in this bar chart. So with this, our bar chart is ready. So now I can run this and see the results. So I now run this 
And well, we got this message of success. And now I'm gonna open this Excel file so we can see the results. All right, here I opened the bar chart file that we created before. And here we have the pivot table and also we have the bar chart. So this bar chart corresponds to the data in our pivot table. So we created this using the data here and also the categories here on the left. And as you can see, we got uh, here the title that we set here. So sales by product line. We also got this style number five. So these are the colors and the format we have. And well, we did all of this using OpenPy Excel. And one of the coolest things we did when we wrote this code is that no matter how many rows this pivot table has, our code is gonna work because here we use minimum and maximum values here. So if this pivot table has more rows and more columns, this is still gonna work because we use references. And that's it for this video. In this video, we'll learn how to create bar charts using OpenPy Excel. Okay, in the previous video, we learned how to create a bar chart. So we use this pivot table to create this bar chart that you see here. And now we're gonna see how to create formulas like this one. So for example, we're gonna see how to sum these two values, but now we're gonna do this with Python. So instead of writing this formula manually, we're gonna do this here with Python. All right, first I'm gonna show you the easiest way to create a formula in this spreadsheet using Python. So here, I'm gonna first write this formula. So I write sum and well, we have this formula. And now I'm gonna copy this formula. So the easiest way to create this formula is just writing this in Python. So first, I'm gonna paste it here and I'm gonna put this in quotes. And well, I'm gonna here set this cell, which is B8 equal to this formula. So here I write sheet. So first, of course, you have to read this Excel file. So we have this bar chart that XLSX, which is the name of my file that we created before in the previous video. And then we have to select the sheet. So we have to select this report sheet. This is the report sheet that we have here. And well, we name this as sheet. So now we select sheet and we select the cell we want to work with. So in this case, B8, and then we write this. So sheet B8, and this equal to this expression. So this is basically the same as doing this. So we have B8 here, and we write this equal to this formula. So it's basically the same. So we have this, but now in code. And now to complete this, I'm gonna set a style for this cell. So I only have to write the name of this cell and then that style. I'm gonna set this equal to currency. So the format is gonna be currency. And well, we're gonna have here a, a dollar sign, I think. And well, we're gonna have the sum and this sum is gonna be in currency format. So, okay, now let's run this and let's see the results. So first I'm gonna delete this because I don't wanna do this manually. So I delete this and now let's see the result. We should have the same, but now with Python. So I run this and well, we see the result, but actually we didn't save this file. So I'm gonna write here WB just to make sure everything was saved and that's saved. And I'm gonna export this in another file. So this is gonna be called report that xlsx so now i run this and let's see the results so now we have this file and well let's open this file all right i have the file here opened and as you can see we have here the the sum that we did before so here is the formula and here's the value and we have here the dollar sign because we set this cell with the currency style so great so with this we could create this, uh, we could make this sum using Python, but we did this for only one cell. And what if now we want to do this uh, sum for all the cells that are here? So probably we want to calculate the sum for all the cells that are here. So now let's do that. So the simplest thing that you can do is just copy 
and well you can duplicate this and for example for b9 or actually for c8 you can just uh, change here c and c and then you can write c6 and then c7 so that's what you can do but now i'm going to show you a better way to do this with a for loop so i'm going to delete this and i'm going to comment this out so instead of doing this manually like for every column you have we can use a for loop so first we're going to use these references that we had before so we're going to use the minimum and maximum columns and rows so here first i'm going to look through the rows that we have here so let's see which rows or actually let's see which columns we're going to use because we're going to sum these columns between b and g so I'm going to use the columns that are in this range so from b to g and to do that we have to use the minimum column plus one so minimum column is a plus one b and the maximum column so okay let's do this so first minimum column plus one so basically this is the the range where our data is so you might remember from previous videos this was in yellow and this belonged to our data so b to g okay so minimum column plus one and then the maximum column so these are our two references and we need to loop through this uh, range so to do that i'm going to use the range method so i write here range open parentheses and then we have to write the minimum value and the minimum value is min underscore column plus one and then we have to write the maximum value but when we use range we have to write always the maximum value plus one because range gets this value minus one so it's kind of tricky i'm going to show you here but first i'm going to use this for loop so for i in range and then let's print this so first i'm going to print let's say from 1 to 10 so 1 to 10 so you can see what i'm talking about so then i print i and let's see here i'm not going to save this so i just want to show you how this works so when we print a range from 1 to 10 you see that we got 1 2 3 until 9 so we got the last element minus 1 so that's why i said before that we have to use here plus one so if we write here plus one we actually get the number 10 so that's why here i'm going to delete this i'm using max underscore column plus one because i want to get the maximum column here so now i'm going to print i and we can see the result so here we got from two until seven and that's correct because here we want from b until g so b is number two and g is number seven so that's great we got the columns here so we got from two until seven great now i'm going to import something called get underscore column underscore letter and to do that we have to write from open pi xl that utilities or actually it's just utils and then we have to write import get underscore column underscore letter and this helps me get the letter from a column so i'm going to show you here i'm gonna just write here get underscore column underscore letter and inside parentheses i write the i so here if i print i'm going to print i and then i'm going to print this so we can compare the value so here i run this and as you can see we get two for the column b we get three for column C and we get seven for column G. So as you can see, this gets the letter based on the number. So if we give seven, this returns G. If we give two, this returns B. So that's what get underscore column underscore letter does. And we're gonna use these letters to create this formula. So here, I'm gonna copy and paste it so we can see much better what we're gonna do so here instead of writing b8 for example i'm gonna open an f string and i'm gonna open here 
curly braces to make this a variable. So instead of writing B, I'm going to use a letter. So here, I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to set this equal to letter. So this is my variable, letter equal to, and well, this expression. So here we got the letter, for example, letter B, and then instead of writing here B, I'm going to write letter. So we got here the letter and the number. So now I'm going to do the same here in the formula. I'm going to open here this F string and then instead of writing B here, I open a square brackets twice and then I write letter here and here. So we have letter and well, with this, we have the letter in our formula and actually we can do the same here. So instead of B again, one more time letter and well, this is done. And finally, we have to change the numbers. So instead of writing eight, we have to use a reference. In this case, I'm going to use the maximum and minimum rows. So for example, here we had uh, B8 and this represents this uh, cell B8. And this is the maximum row plus one. So this sum formula is always going to be located one cell below our pivot table. So we only have to sum the last row of our pivot table or the maximum row of our pivot table plus one. And this guarantees that we're going to get this uh, cell that we have here, B8. So for example, row seven plus one is eight. So we got this row eight. So now let's write this here. So instead of writing eight, we have to write the maximum row plus one. And well, the same goes here maximum row plus one. And as you might expect, the formula is always going to be located in maximum row plus one. So that always happens. And well, then we have to edit this number six and number seven. So to do this, we have to take a different approach. So here, let's see. So we sum always the range where the data is. So in this case, B6 and B7. So here we can say that the minimum value is always the minimum row plus one, because in the minimum row, we always have the headers and after the headers is the data. So that always happens. And the maximum row is going to be where the branch ends. So for example, this one ends in B7. And this is exactly where our pivot table ends. So we have minimum row plus one, which is this, and then we have maximum row. So this is our range. So now let's do this here. So instead of writing six, I write minimum row plus one. And instead of writing seven, I write maximum row. And this is going to be true as long as you have a pivot table with this format, which is actually the standard format for a pivot table. Yeah, you always have this header and you always have these categories and always the data is here. So basically this is going to work usually. So now that we have this, I'm going to first comment this out because I'm not, I don't want to print this I. And what I'm going to do here is print the value. So I'm going to comment this out and let's see if we did all of this correctly. So I'm going to, I'm going to print this and let's see the result. So now I run this and well, we get here some B6, B7, which is what we had here before, but now we also have C6, C7, D6, D7, until G6, G7. So this is basically what's going to be here. So we get all of these formulas. And that's great because we did this with a for loop and we didn't do this with uh, manually one by one. So great. Now that we verify this is correct, I'm going to comment this out and I'm going to uncomment this and actually I'm going to delete this because I'm not going to use it. All right. Now that everything is ready, I'm going to uncomment this wb.save and I'm going to create this report. So I'm going to run this and let's see what happens. So I run this 
And now I have this file in my working directory. So I'm gonna open this to see the results. All right, I just opened this file. And as you can see, we have all the formulas that we created before with the for loop in Python. And well, as I mentioned before, this is gonna work. The code that we wrote here is gonna work as long as this pivot table has this format. But anyway, you can add more columns. So you can add here more columns or you can add here more rows. But well, the format has to be something like this. And that's it for this video. In this video, we learn how to create formulas in our spreadsheet using Python. All right, so far we learned how to create our pivot table, how to create formulas for multiple columns, and also how to create this bar chart using Python. And now what we're gonna do is complete this report by adding a title and subtitle and also changing the font. So let's do this. So I'm going here to the right. And well, first we have to import load underscore workbook from OpenPyXL. So we read this Excel file, which I name report.xlsx. And then, well, we have to select the first sheet, which is the report sheet. So once we have this, we can have access to the cells. So I write sheet and then we open square brackets. So I wanna put the title here in A1. So what I have to do is write here A1 and then we can write the title. So I'm gonna put a title which is a sales report. So this is my title. And then I'm gonna write a subtitle in A2 and this is gonna be named as the month. So I'm gonna write January. So we have the title sales report and then we have the month in A2. Okay, now let's edit the font. So I'm gonna edit the font of the title. So I write that font, but first we have to import font from OpenPyXL. So I write from OpenPyXL, that styles, import font. So now I can use this uh, font. So I only have to write font and then we can choose the, the font we want. So in this case, I'm gonna choose Arial. So I write this and then we can select a uh, bold, for example. So I'm gonna set this equal to true. So this title is gonna be in bold and then we can set the size. So I write size equal to, and you can choose any size you want. So I'm gonna choose 20 for this. And then we can do the same for the subtitle. So I write sheet, then a2 dot font. So this is the font attribute. And then we can change this using this font that we imported. And well, I'm gonna set this equal to Arial. And here you can choose any font that you know from Microsoft Excel. In my case, I don't remember so many fonts, so I'm just choosing Arial. So then I write bold equal to true and well, size, this one a bit smaller, in this case 10. And well, after this, as usual, we have to save the results. So we write wb.save and I'm gonna set the name as report underscore January. So this is gonna be my file. And now I only have to run this. And well, I'm gonna open this to see the results. All right, I just opened this file, report underscore January. And here we have the title, sales report. And this is in bold and well, the size is 20, as you can see here. And we also have the subtitle, January. And again, it's in bold, but now the size is 10. So we successfully created this title and subtitle and we could edit the font. And that's it. Now feel free to go to our code and hover on the font class that we have here. So you can see all the parameters that you can use. So for example, a strike, color, scheme, size, bold, italic, and so on. All right, in this video, we're gonna put all the pieces together and we're gonna convert the pivot table into an Excel file. So we're gonna use the three scripts that we created in the previous videos. So this one added a chart, this one here added formulas, and this one here added a title and a subtitle. So I put these three scripts together in this script that I named pivot to report. And well, this is basically the same. I just made a little change here. I added a variable that I named month, 
and well here we can set the amount of the year and well this is going to be also the amount of this report and since i added this here i changed the name of our file that is going to be exported so here instead of writing report underscore january as we had before here we have report underscore january here what i did is uh introduce this um curl braces to put this month variable so we can change here for example march december and our excel file is going to have the same name report underscore march or report underscore december and also here in the subtitle i set the month so we have here in the report we have the name of the month so with that our script is done so this is basically the same that we have here in number two, number three, and number four, but now with this month variable. And well, the input is gonna be our pivot table that we have here, and the output is gonna be a report with the formulas and with the bar chart, and well, with the title and subtitle. So now let's run this, and well, we got a message of success, and now let's see the result. And here we have the file. So the file's name report underscore February, and well, we have the title, we have the subtitle, here we have the formulas for each column, and well, we also have the bar chart. So we successfully convert this pivot table into this report. And we could do all of this by putting together the scripts that we wrote in the previous videos. And that's it for this video. In the following video, I'm gonna show you how to convert this script into an executable file, so you can automate all of this even more. All right, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to convert this pi file into an executable. So right now we have our script, which is a pi file, and we're gonna convert this into an executable so we can automate all of this. So first, what we have to do before converting this pi file into an executable is importing two libraries. So we're gonna import OS and we're gonna import also sys. So I write, OS and then sys. So now we have to create a path for our executable. And to do that, we're gonna do this. So we write OS that path that dear name. And then we write sys that executable. And this represents the path where our executable is gonna be located. So now I set this equal to application underscore path. And we need to do this because when we convert a script into an executable, the path become a bit messy. So we need to make sure that we specify exactly where is the path where our executable is located. So this is why we do this. All right, now, instead of writing here uh, the name of the file, as we did before, we have to join this name of the file with the path that we have here. So here, instead of only writing this, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to create an input path. So I write input underscore path. And we set this equal to os.path.join. And we're going to join the application path with the name of our file. So the result is going to be the input path. And this input path is what we're going to read here in load underscore workbook. So here, we need to make sure that this pivot table that x ls x is gonna be located in the same folder where our executable is gonna be located. So I'm gonna do this later. When I create the executable file, I'm gonna put this Excel file inside the same folder. So you have to do the same. Okay, now that we have the input path, I'm gonna create also an output path. So I scroll all the way down and here, instead of writing the name of the file, I'm gonna create an output path. So I write output underscore path. And we set this equal to os.path.join. So we have to join path again. And well, again, application path, and we join this with the name of the file. So here we write, and with this we have the output path. So I write output path, and we put this inside that save. And well, with this, we're gonna export this report file inside the same folder where our 
executable file is going to be located. So the input and the output are going to be in the same folder where the executable is going to be located. And that's something that we should keep in mind. All right, now to customize our automation even more, what I'm going to do is ask the name of the month. So instead of just setting the name of the month, what I'm going to do here is write month equal to and here use the input function. So instead of just writing the name of the month, every time we want to run this executable file, we're going to ask the name of the month. So I'm going to write here introduce month. So this is very cool because every time you run the executable file, you can change the name of the month. So it's not always going to be February, but it can be March, it can be December, it can be July, any month you want. And all the changes are going to be seen here in the code. So here, when you set the month here, it's going to be the same month that you write here. So that's very cool. And well, I'm going to delete this. And with this, this is done. So now we can convert this PI file into executable because we already set the input and the output path. So now we can open the terminal and well, here we can run the command that converts the PI file into executable. So to do that first, we have to go to the folder where our script is located. So in my case, my script is named 6.py2exe and this script is located in the tutorial folder. So you can see this here and well, in the terminal, I also have to be in the tutorial folder, which is this one. So once you are in the folder where your script is located, you have to run the following command. Uh, py installer, then hyphen hyphen one file, and then you have to write the name of your script. So in my case, 6.py hyphen two hyphen exe dot py. So this is the name of my script. And well, in case you don't have pi installer installed, you can write pip install pi installer. Well, in case you don't have it, but probably you have this library installed because we already did this step many times in this course. So, okay, once this is done, you only have to press enter. And after this, an executable is going to be created into a folder named dist. So we're going to create two folders a build folder and a disk folder. And the executable is going to be located inside the disk folder. So we got a message of success. And now let's check this folder. And now if we go here on the left panel, we see that we have two folders, the build folder and the disk folder. And inside the disk folder, we have this executable. And now I'm going to open this folder. So here I'm in the same folder, but now in a different view. But now you can see that, well, we have the executable. So to run this, first we need to put the pivot underscore table inside this folder. So we put this file inside this folder because as I mentioned before, we need this file in the same folder where the executable is located. So now that we have this file, we can run this executable. And to do this on a Mac, I'm going to open with terminal. So I open with the terminal and now I have the terminal. And as you might remember, I added an input in my code. So here we have this input. So as you can see, it's asking me for the month. So it says introduce month. So what I have to do here is just write the month. So I'm going to write, let's say March. So this is the name of the month. And well, I press enter. And as you can see, this was executed. So we have here a new file named report underscore March dot X LSX. And this has the report with the title, the subtitle, the formulas and the bar chart. And well, I can open this one here, but I don't have Microsoft Excel. So it's going to open with the numbers up in my Mac. And what I'm going to do is open this one here in Google Sheets. So I have this report underscore March. And well, you can see all this data uh, was successfully created. So we have the formulas, we have the title, we have the subtitle with the name of the month I said before, which is March. And well, also we have this uh, bar chart. And well, that's it. We successfully automated our Excel report. In this video, I'm going to show you how to send messages in WhatsApp using Python. So you can send a message to anyone you want at any time you want. So let's get started. 
Okay, the first method to send messages in WhatsApp using Python is using a library named PyWhatKit. This library allows us to easily send messages uh, in WhatsApp. So first, what I'm going to do is open a terminal. I'm here on PyCharm and I'm going to write pip install PyWhatKit. So this is the name of the library. And keep in mind that I'm installing this in a virtual environment and I highly recommend you to install it in a virtual environment because this library has a lot of dependencies. So you want to avoid some conflict. So install it in a virtual environment. So I'm going to hit enter and now it's going to install. So in my case, I have this library already installed. So I have the message requirement already satisfied. but probably it's going to take some seconds or even a minute for you to install this library. All right, now that we have the library installed, I'm going to close up the terminal and I'm going to import this library. So I'm going to write import pi what kit and to send a message, I write pi what kit that send what msg. And inside, I'm going to use this parameter. So the first one is the phone number, as you can see here. The second one is the message. The third one is the time in hours. And the fourth one is the time in minutes. So for the phone number, I'm going to write the phone number with the country code. So we write plus the country code. For example, in America, I think it's plus one and then any number you want. The second one is the message you want to send and I'm going to write just test then the time in hours. So here I write the time uh, I think here is 717 in the morning. So I'm going to write here seven in hours and then in minutes I'm going to write 721. Now in the phone number, I'm not going to write the phone number. I'm going to hide it because I don't want to get any message. So here I'm going to define a variable just for the sake of this video, which is named phone number. Now I write input and here I write enter phone number. So every time I run this script, it's going to ask me for the phone number and I'm going to write it. So here I'm going to delete this and I'm going to just copy and paste it. You don't need to define this variable. You can write the phone number here. All right, before running this script, keep in mind that in the browser that you use, you need to log into WhatsApp manually. So go ahead and go to your browser, Google Chrome or Safari, and log into WhatsApp using the QR uh, code before we run this code. So I already did this and I'm just going to run this code and try it out. So I'm going to check 719 is now. So I want to get the results faster. So I'm going to put 720. So now I run this and I wait a couple of seconds. But first I need to introduce the phone number and I paste the number and it says in four seconds WhatsApp will open and after 15 seconds it will deliver your message. So now WhatsApp's opening. Now uh, it wrote my message as you can see below on the bottom of the screen. So now let's wait 15 seconds and it's going to send the message. So as you can see here, it just sent the message, which is test and it did it just without any problem. Now I'm going back to PyCharm and I close this one and I'm going to show you different things you can do with this library. OK, you can add more parameters to this method and you can even close the window that was open. So before we open this WhatsApp window, but as you can see, the window is still there. So we can add a parameter in the method to indicate that we want the window to close after we send the message. So to do that, we only uh, I'm going to copy and paste this one and we need to add two or three more parameters. First is the wait time. As you can see here, the wait time is by default 15. So I'm just going to leave it 15. So this is our, this is the seconds that you have to wait before the, the message is delivered. So I'm going to leave it as 15 seconds. This is not so important, but now we see this one tab underscore closed. So this indicates whether we want to close the windows or not. So this is by default set to false 
and we're going to set it equal to true. So I write true. And finally, we have close time. So these are the number of seconds that we're going to wait until the tab is closed. So I'm going to set this to two seconds. And basically what we're saying here is that we want the tab to close after the message is delivered and we're going to wait only two seconds. So let's run this code first. I'm going to just change the time because it's not 721 anymore, but I'm going to set it to 725 and now run. So it pays the number and it says in 18 seconds, WhatsApp will open and after 15 seconds, the message will be delivered. So 15 seconds here is the same what we set here. This is the default, but we could change it. But that's not important for what we're doing right now. So here, another WhatsApp window was opened and it says here again, test, as you can see here. And now let's wait 15 seconds for the message to be delivered. So just a couple of seconds more and here it's test and that window or the tab was closed as you can see. Great. So what I showed you so far is how to send messages to contacts. So we can also send messages to groups. So now let me show you how to do it. So to send messages to a group that you're part of, we only need to get the ID. So every group in WhatsApp has an ID and you can get the ID by going to any group you want and choosing that group info section. Then you have to tap on the invite via link option and copy that link. I already have the link of the group I'm going to use for this video. And if you didn't get it, I'm going to leave a guide that you can use to get the ID of the group you want to test. So here, I'm going to define first um, a variable like we did before in phone number. But in this case, I'm going to set this group underscore ID. So enter group ID. And this is not necessary. It's just for the sake of this video. But now we're going to use pi what kit. And here to send a messages to a group, we have to use send. I think it's this one send what msg underscore two underscore group. So now the parameters are similar, but instead of phone number, uh, we have to use the ID of the group. So here I'm going to set write ID. Then the second is going to be the message. So test group. Uh, the third one is the time. So in my case, seven because it's seven in the morning and the time in minutes. I'm going to set it to 31. So here it's basically the same. Just uh, the only thing that changes is the ID. So now I copy group ID and I paste it here. So now we can test this out. So I right click and run this one. And now it's going to ask my well, my phone number because I didn't comment this out. So just give me a second. I comment this out. And now I'm going to run this again and it's asking my the group ID. I just paste the group ID. I press enter and now it says in 49 seconds, the message uh, WhatsApp will open and then the message will be delivered. Now I'm going to cut the video and I'm going to come back when the automation starts. So now it's working and it found the name of the group. And now let's wait for the message to be type below on the on the bottom. And as you can see, it says test group and the test group message was delivered to this group. Great. We just learned how to send messages in WhatsApp to contacts and to groups using PyWhatKit.